You know, we've been talking about, um, we started last week talking about the word edify. The sermon series is all about building one another up or lifting one another up or encouraging one another up, which is scripturally important um, from the words of Jesus himself, but also for the body of Christ to be comforted, to be consoled, to be built up. And um, I have a note here that I'm supposed to say before I get into this. I think I got to center myself for a minute. This afternoon, after this service is over, um, after second service is over, excuse me, there will be uh, people uh, from the rest program spending the night here upwards of 30 to 40 homeless with children. And uh, sent the church, churches in our area rotate through the rest program to offer a place, a safe place for them to sleep. Many of you have signed up to provide food and we so much appreciate that. At the end of this service, there'll be a little sign-up sheet. We're looking for about five men or so to come early at 6.15, I think, next Sunday morning to set the church back up because at this evening, this, this room will be emptied and filled with cots and sleeping bags. And, uh, and then our church feeds them all through the week. And then at the end of that morning, on Sunday morning, they, they leave here at 6 a.m. They are leaving from New Beginnings Church this morning and then coming here this afternoon. So after second service, people are gonna come and help set that up, tear this down and set that up. But after before first service, next week at 6.15, if you want to come, sign up. We'll call you. We'll remind you, and you can come and help us um, set the church back up for next Sunday. All right. You have to forgive me a minute. I'm kind of disheveled a little bit. I don't know why. I'm going to pray. Jesus, we just thank you. We thank you that you are our great God. We thank you, Lord, that you are our king, and we thank you, Lord, that you are our friend. And we pray this morning that you would open up our hearts, that you would guide us and lead us into all truth, Lord, that your Holy Spirit, Lord, would come and, and bring fruit to us, Lord, bring the word to us this morning. We pray that it would enter our hearts, that it would encourage us and truly would build us up and help us to build one another up. We thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so... How many of you know who Zerubbabel was? <laughs> I heard this the other day. I got to tell you this. I thought this was pretty cool. How many of you have read the Bible from cover to cover? That's awesome. That's awesome. Now, it's not easy to remember everything that you read from cover to cover. But if you haven't read from cover to cover, then you probably haven't heard of Zerubbabel. And it's going to be pretty embarrassing when you get to heaven and he introduces himself. Hey, what did you think about me? I don't know who you are, right? So let me help you out, but also let me encourage you to read the word, all right? So Zerubbabel uh, was exiled from Jerusalem to Babylon. And then he lived long enough to, uh, to go back to Jerusalem from exile to help build the second temple. That's who Zerubbabel was. But Zerubbabel was like any of us, any of us that are following Christ, who is on a journey and oftentimes on that journey, we need to be encouraged by the Lord. In the Old Testament, the Lord spoke through his prophets, right? And he revealed those truths to those prophets. And then he had the prophets speak to his people. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would only rest on one person or a place, right? At a time, Old Testament. New Testament, after the resurrection of Jesus and the ascension to the Father, he sent the Holy Spirit to the church. And this morning, we're going to be talking about how the Holy Spirit encourages us, how the Holy Spirit encouraged Zerubbabel through the prophet Haggai. I don't know if I said his name right, <laughs> but also Zechariah. So if you'll turn to the book of Zechariah, chapter 4, we'll just quickly kind of see how the Holy Spirit was used to speak through someone to encourage Zerubbabel. So any of you know that a building project um, is wearing, it'll wear you down. And in this day, there was great resistance to the rebuilding of the temple. And uh, Zerubbabel was being discouraged by many people that were coming against him. 
and those that were uh, building the temple, and he was literally being discouraged. So the Lord spoke through a prophet, Zechariah. He said to me, verse, chapter 4, verse 6, he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. In other words, I'm going to speak to you. I want you to tell this to Zerubbabel. And this is where we get that famous passage of scripture that is now given to you this morning, I hope, in a little bit more context than just reading it, right? He says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? In other words, all the trouble that's before Zerubbabel. Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. All this great mountain, all this great resistance, uh, it shall become flattened out and made straight. And he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace, grace to it. And it's a picture and a type, if you will, but it actually a, an actual event that actually occurred. And you can imagine Zerubbabel hearing this word. When he got this word, how he might have been encouraged and how he might have been able to use this word from the Lord to help him get through really, really hard times, to really get him through where God wanted to take him. This morning, if you were sitting out here, if you've ever been uh, riddled with alcoholism or, or riddled with uh, 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 drugs or something that has kept you uh, buried down in shame and, and regret this morning, as you watched the video, I hope, and as you heard and you saw the report um, from our sister Lori, you, especially you, especially those that struggle in that way, were deeply encouraged and deeply reminded. And I'm telling you, all of us hit hard spots. All of us hit places in our life where we become discouraged. And so the Lord took time out of his day, if you will, to speak to Zechariah, to speak to Zerubbabel, and to remind him, listen, it's not going to even be by you but it'll be by my might, by my might, and by my power, and you will overcome, and you will bring forward the top stone, which is the finished work of the temple, and shouts of grace, grace, grace to it. And any of us, I'm just going to speak to Lori again because it's so fresh in my mind. Any of us that have overcome, we must confess and we must admit, and it's easy, it's easy to admit that, you know, without God, we could not have done this. It was his grace. It was his mercy. In fact, when Jesus comes and they, it was said that he was the fullness of the Father, he was on display. The Father was on full display uh, through Jesus, and, and it was said about Jesus that he was grace upon grace, and that he gives us grace upon grace. He gives us encouragement. He gives us a special a form of encouragement through the one another's in the body. And this is where we're going to be heading a little bit this morning. But he certainly needed it. I wanted to also, the last minute, I kind of remembered this other passage of scripture, and I wanted to share it with you too. Um, and this came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel. He says, and I didn't give it to you, Steve, just listen, please. But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Zodak, the high priest. Be strong, all of you people of the land, declares the Lord. And the work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. And finally, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. In other words, more encouragement, more encouragement, more encouragement from the Father to help them get that temple built. So this brings us to another promise, right? I'm just going to paraphrase this promise that was found uh, in, in the book of Ezekiel through the prophet Joel, right? He said, there'll be come a time, Right? where the Holy Spirit, where the Spirit will descend basically upon the church. And I'm, I'm, I'm just paraphrasing, just paraphrasing. And um, when it comes, it's going to bring great power. It's going to be, become a great opportunity to witness. It's going to bring boldness. It's going to bring strength. It's going to bring encouragement, all right? This was prophesied by Ezekiel, in Ezekiel, in the, the book of Ezekiel through the prophet Joel, here comes the Holy Spirit, all right? We're going to go fast forward for the sake of time through this message. I apologize in advance. I'm going to be going through a lot of scripture, but I hope at the end of this, you will be edified. 
you'll be encouraged, you will be built up, which this morning is the work and one of the purposes of the Holy Spirit, all right? So, after this prophecy from Joel, thousands of years later, here's the words of Jesus, John 14, 15. John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you, to encourage you, to strengthen you, to help you. And he will be with you forever, Lori. He will be with you forever, which was what was prayed up here. And what was told to Lori, I heard in my ear, to always remember you're not alone. This is the words of Jesus. This ought to bring you great comfort, great encouragement, especially if anyone's walked in here discouraged. The maker of the universe is giving you a promise to help you, is giving you a promise to be with you, to not forsake you, to not leave you. The maker, the creator of the universe himself saying, I want to help you. I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. The spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. And look at the place in which the spirit now dwells. For he lives with you and will be in you. He lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as an orphan, Jesus says. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. How encouraging is that? On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Oh, my goodness. Take these scriptures home, remember them, and reread them so you can take time to really meditate on them. I guarantee it will encourage you all the way down to your soul. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. It's interesting to me, right? that we see this transaction of God's grace, of God's mercy, of God's promise of the Holy Spirit, but there's this connection or there's this understanding that when the spirit of truth comes and he guides and he leads you into all truth, then you begin to walk that way. You begin to love him back that way. You begin to follow his commands that way. And this is one of the works of the Holy Spirit and uh, I wanted to, uh, uh, to read to you another passage of Scripture in Luke 24, verse 44 through 49. Again, Jesus speaking. He said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Everything in the Old Testament must be fulfilled. And he comes to fulfill all of these things. Then he opened up their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer. He's just testifying about what has already happened. All right, this has already occurred. He's speaking to his disciples. And he says, this is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. This is instructions, or this is a prophecy from Jesus himself spoken to his disciples. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And we know where that's going. If you know the Bible, that's going to Acts chapter 2, all right? But Jesus is saying to them, Listen, I, the, there's a promise, all right? So the one thing that you can take, if you're a note taker, you could say this to yourself. It will remind you of what we've been, where we've been so far. The Holy Spirit was promised by the Father. The Holy Spirit was promised to us by the Father. Father was prophesied, and it was promised by the Father to be given to us, all right? And then um, he says, I want you to go. 
You're going to become witnesses of me. And then I'm going to send my promise, this promise from the Father upon you. But go and stay there until it comes. I'm going to send a helper. All right? Now, before we get to that, I want to give you some, a little bit of insight into the role, if, or if, you, if, 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 if the scripture can reveal it to you better than I can. We're going to read some scripture here. John 16, 5. John 16, 5. Again, Jesus speaking. John 16, 5. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. He's telling them about his pending death. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, then the helper, or the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. If I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, so here we go. So take a look at this. It's kind of compacted inside a few, one small verse basically on, on what the Holy Spirit's intention is when the Holy Spirit comes. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin. He will convince the world that they are not holy. He will convince us of our sin, right? But not only our sin, this is, this is so, so good, and righteousness and judgment. And so he also convinces, the Holy Spirit convinces us of his righteousness and our unrighteous, all at the same time. The Holy Spirit comes and reveals this to us, and judgment that's placed upon sin. The Holy Spirit reveals this truth to us. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. And yes, we can see very clearly that there is a ruler of this world, Satan, alive and well. And unfortunately, uh, is doing all he can to keep us from following Christ. But there's judgment on him. And this is the Holy Spirit's role. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot even bear them now. But when the Spirit of truth comes, so when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. So you see, the Holy Spirit is a person. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. The Holy Spirit will always glorify me. He will glorify me. He will glorify Jesus, for he will take what is mine, declare it to you, and all the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And so this is really good news, right? So salvation comes to the believer. The Holy Spirit comes to the believer. The Holy Spirit encourages us. It, uh, it guides us into all truth. It empowers us. And it helps us to hear the voice of God, helps us to understand God, who God is, so forth and so on. All right. Kind of rushing through here. I hope you get something to take home today. All right. So now, the Holy Spirit descends upon the church. Read it from Acts 1 down to Acts 2. The Holy Spirit... Uh, Jesus did what he said. He's going to send to the Father. He's going to send the Holy Spirit to the church. He told them to go wait in this room until this power would clothe them from on high, right? Now, after, immediately after the Holy Spirit descends upon that upper room, right, there was all kinds of things that happened that were uncommon. But one of the things that's very common through the power of the Holy Spirit is the preaching of God's word and, and, and what comes out of God's word because the word reveals the truth about who God is and the truth about how much we need Jesus, right? It's not the power of the preacher. It's not the power of just the words. It's the power of the truth that springs off the words that lands on someone's heart and says, oh my gosh, oh wretched man that I am, I need salvation. I am convinced by the power of the Holy Spirit, supernaturally, invisibly, will, will reveal to me my sin, reveal to me Christ's righteousness, will give me faith, will act, give me access to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, will indwell me 
No longer I live, but Christ in me. It's an act of the Holy Spirit. I, you know, if, if, ask yourself right now, right? How encouraged would you be without the power of Christ living in you right now? How encouraged would you be? Where would you get your strength? Where would you get your courage, your own self-will, or from a bottle, or from a title? Where would you get it? Where would you get your encouragement? Not by my strength, not by my power, but by his spirit, says the Lord. I need to hear what was revealed to Zerubbabel. Now, after this, this, this beautiful dissension of the Holy Spirit falls, something happens in Acts chapter 2, verse 36. All of a sudden, truth is revealed to Peter. The scriptures are revealed to Peter. The anointing power of the Holy Spirit is given to Peter. Jesus himself is working in and through Peter, and he says this. Let all the house of Israel therefore know. He, stu- he stands up and preaches. Now let all the house of Israel, he's speaking to Jews, therefore know for certain that God has made him both, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. This is on the heels of them saying these people are drunk with new wine. They don't know what they're doing. They don't understand what's going on. And then Peter stands up and says to them, don't you remember what the prophet Joel said that the Holy Spirit would come? And this is that, right? That happened, you know, 2,000 years ago, and it's still happening today. Still happening today. But so he stands up and he preaches this word that you crucified Christ. Man, talking about being convinced of sin. It's right out of the gate. You crucified Christ. Now then, now when they heard this, here comes the conviction of the Holy Spirit. They were cut to the heart. And Peter and the rest of the apostles answered and said, what shall we do? Okay, I got, I, you got me, right? Hands up, I surrender, you got me, what do I do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is a gift to the believer, to the repentant believer. The Holy Spirit is a gift. What's a repentant believer? It's one that suddenly realizes the direction I'm going, the things I'm doing, the things I'm saying, all the stuff that's falling away from me or around me may not be of him. And he is going to lead me and guide me into all truth and convince me of that. And I'm going to make some changes by the power, not of my own might, my own will, but the power of the Holy Spirit. He encourages us to become like him and to walk like him. And then it's not only for us. This is really good news. Our two grandboys spent the weekend with us. They'll be with us today during the Super Bowl. We ought to really enjoy that. For the promise is for you and all for, also for your children. That's really good news. And not only for me and for my children, but for all who are far off, all across the world, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Is he calling you? Has he already called you? Have you already believed? Have you already been baptized? Have you already just surrendered? Then, then be encouraged today. The Holy Spirit is alive and well living in you and through you. And you know what? If you're a duck, then you're going to walk like a duck. You're going to quack like a duck. You're going to look like a duck. And if you got the Holy Spirit in you, then you probably are going to look like Jesus. You're going to do the things that Jesus does. And you're going you're gonna to love like Jesus does. You're going to forgive like Jesus. You're not going to co-sign sin like Jesus doesn't either. Because I'm going to tell you, the Holy Spirit, I've, I've been told this one time, and I just loved it. It was just so true. It says the Holy Spirit doesn't just do more than make you jump and dance and sing. It also shuts your mouth up sometimes. The Holy Spirit convinces us that we need a Savior, and the Holy Spirit comes and dines with us and lives with us and lives in and through us. And it's the Holy Spirit's work that wants to work in and through you to turn to someone 
and to bless them and to encourage them and not to despitefully use them or hurt them. God is really good. And this is really good news. And I don't know if you need to be encouraged this morning, but the Holy Spirit is available to you. All right? So, we're going to continue. Um, how do you get the Holy Spirit? Well, uh, you, you, you don't have to earn it. You don't have to work for it. That's for sure. Take a look at Luke eleven nine. 9. Jesus says this, I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened. I mean, promise, promise, promise. Promise, promise, promise. Ask, you'll receive. Knock, it'll be opened. Seek, you'll find. Promise, promise. What father among you, if a son asks for fish, will instead of a fish give him a snake or a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? This is pretty convicting right here. If you then who are evil, all of us fathers whose sons would come to us and say, if you guys are evil, well, you got, you got issues. <laughs> but you would still give your son what he asked for. He says this, he goes, um... How much more will then the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So as we go forward in this series, Edify, without coming to grips and coming to terms with this gift of the Holy Spirit, then you're going to likely be working out of your own self, your own will, or your own fears, or your own plans. Holy Spirit guides you into all truth. He reveals the truth to you. He's a wonderful teacher, right? He also gives gifts. He also gives you his spirit that is, you know, love and peace and joy and kindness. You know those things. This all comes from the gifts of the Holy Spirit or the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to pause just for a second. And um, I want to tell you about something. And, and you're going to hear about it really soon because it's spreading in a good way, it's spreading. But there is uh, what some are calling a revival right now at Asbury University in Wilmore, Kentucky, a little town of about 3,000 people with a seminary. Many of you have heard about the Jesus movement, or I don't know if there's anyone in here that was saved during the Jesus movement. Raise your hand. There's several that were saved during the Jesus movement. They have attributed the beginning of that movement, which we think seemed to think was in California in the early 70s, and certainly the whole, uh, you know, multiplication of ministry came from uh, the hippie movement that was in Haight-Ashbury that went down to Orange County and was spread back up here, and many people were saved and baptized and, and repented of sin and started walking away from this, that, that horrible lifestyle that they were involved in in the name of love. And, uh, and started to follow Christ, that it was a, it was a legitimate revival. Well, it actually, uh, they, they traced its origin to this little seminary in uh, Hillmore, Kentucky, at a little seminary. And what happened was in 1970, in February of 1970, there was a college chapel and at the end of that college chapel on February 2nd, 1970, the students, as they said, lingered. They didn't want to leave. The Holy Spirit was encouraging them. The Holy Spirit was speaking to them. Suddenly, there was no pastor on the platform. There was a few worship leaders with no great instruments and droves and droves and droves of college kids were coming down before the altar. And guess what they were doing? Exactly what the Holy Spirit said they were going to do. Repenting of sin. Save me now. A beautiful time of refreshing when the Holy Spirit comes. 
Holy Spirit was coming and saving people from their sins, redeeming them, washing away their sins, their mind, their guilt, their shame, their rebellion, and thousands and thousands. Then it, then it spread to Ohio University, then Tennessee, and so forth. And then before you know it, this revival, this movement, this refreshing of the Holy Spirit causing conviction of sin spread to California. And this movie's coming out real soon. You know, probably, I, I haven't seen it yet, but I've heard pretty good things about it called The Jesus Revolution. It's a documentary, a movie that, that shows how Greg Laurie was saved and how the whole Calvary Chapel movement started in, in Orange County, right? So, last Wednesday, at that same seminary on February, the whatever date that was, a week later, I guess, from the second, 50 years later, uh, this, this uh, unbecoming um, uh, young pastor gave the, um, the message that day out of Romans 12 about how God gives us himself so that we could use what he gives us to help others, to bring justice and mercy and love, right? And at the end of his little uh, chapel service last Wednesday, the students lingered, and they're still there. And now, it, this, is, this is kind of interesting, pray, 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 that it doesn't become something more than what God has intended. Because social media, right, brings anybody and everybody looking for a taste of Jesus all the way to Kentucky when the Holy Spirit is available to every single individual who repents and says, save me now. But there are times of refreshing. And the, 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 um, the, um, the, ride, the people that are, that are writing their experience there all say the same thing. They say they come in, it's peaceful, it's unifying, it's edifying, and the Holy Spirit is just causing a time of refreshing. People come in, they don't want to leave. It holds 2,000 people. And it's been going 24 hours a day. And I think, you know, this coming Wednesday will be seven days if it continues. But it's also spread now to Ohio and to Tennessee in the college campuses. Now, I'm bringing all of this up because, number one, I am deeply encouraged by that. I am deeply, deeply encouraged. I, you know, because of social media, you can Facebook, people are Facebook Live, and they put it down because it's so sacred. They start, and you will see, you won't see a long video, I think. It's because it's just so sacred. They, they want to take it in instead of show everybody else what's happening. There are people from all walks of life coming. Uh, it's beautiful. But just like the book of Acts, when 3,000 people were saved, and many people were coming to repentance, we also read, right, in this scripture, okay, I'm segueing to this. You could look it up when you leave Asbury Revival, Asbury University, Wilmore, Kentucky, uh, at this chapel. You can look it up, experience it for yourself, all right, without having to go to Kentucky. I sent the man that gave that message a message this morning. I asked the Holy Spirit, how can I encourage that man? Right, because Lord knows they're gonna look like, he, like his message sparked a revival, right? I think about Peter, what he contended with after the response, you crucified Jesus, now come and be baptized. And it says 3,000 people were saved immediately and baptized. But one of the things that happens in revivals is people start to really uh, be refreshed and be embraced, right? And that's a wonderful thing. But you know, you know what the proof text is? Is if they were crooked and now they're walking straight. Because he leads and he guides you into all truth. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Then there'll be work continuing in the believer of the Holy Spirit over and over and over. Not just the chapel service, not just the church service. Although 
man, it, 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 and so, so what hap- what's happening now is the, the people are writing about it saying no one's leading it. It's all organic. The, 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 the pastors and, and people on staff at that university are servants now. And it's true. They're just trying to give them water. They're just trying to clean the bathrooms. They're not even going to class right now. The midterms are coming. And they're like, hey, we, we have to honor what God is doing. And I get that, right? But every time, even in the book of Acts, when a real revival work, uh, uh, sprung up, and this is not a pitch for the church. This is just a pitch from the Lord himself. He says he gives good gifts to the church. He gives good gifts to the church. And those gifts are teachers and evangelists and prophets, right? And, 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 and shepherds and elders and deacons, right? Because at some point, all those repentant sinners are going to need help from the body of Christ. And in the Old Testament, all the way through the New Testament, somehow or another, people say, I don't like the, comp- the new church because it's too structured. I, I can't imagine, Right? What would happen to me if I suddenly, suddenly was saved in a chapel service like that, didn't know anything about the scripture? Yes, I know that Jesus is going to send me and lead me to truth, but he's probably going to send me to someone that knows the word, (laughs) that can help me discern, right, truth from error, right? It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. I don't want that thing to stop back there at all, but I can guarantee you at some point it's going to morph into some structure and then people are going to bring a blame man for shutting it down or somebody else to make it look like a zoo or whatever, or circus. All I'm trying to say is that gifts of the Holy Spirit also includes the ones that he wants to give you for the sake of those around you, for your children, for the people in the body, everywhere, right? And, some, and Pastor Tony, the next couple of Sundays are gonna be going through those, right? I, don't think the, I think the timing is just beautiful. If you look at what was going on in our nation and our country in 1970, it's very similar to what's going on in our nation and our country today. I mean, my goodness, they shot down two UFOs the other day. That's what they said. That's exactly what they said. They, they, shut, they shot down two unidentified flying objects. Well, the first one was a balloon. These were probably balloons too, don't get me wrong. But these are interesting times. I mean, I don't know about you. I don't jump into fear, but I'm thinking, hey, if those things can fly over, they could dry, if they can create, you know, a, a virus, I mean, my goodness, what else can they be dropping from the sky? I'm not trying to put fear on anybody. I'm just trying to say we need the, we, we need the Holy Spirit and we need each other. We need salvation. People are dying of fentanyl all over the place. Little kids. Marriages are suffering. There's all kinds of crises. This is nothing new under the sun, but listen, it seems like it's intensifying. So what better time for the Holy Spirit to give us a visit and remind us and convince us of our sin and convince us of his righteousness and convinces us that he wants to live and dine and dwell in us. And out of that, you will know that they are my disciples by their love for one another. And I, I tell you, if I'm going to receive the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit is going to convince me until the time comes where I can forgive those who have hurt me. And I can let it just kind of, kind of, kind of like water off a duck's back after a while because you just know that that's, just gonna, that's not going to go nowhere to pick up an offense and take it. And we need the church. We need the church, the body of Christ. We need each other, and he's chose us to be here, so I guess we're stuck with each other for a little while unless you move to Kentucky. <laughs> so I wrote that man, and I said, you know, I would imagine... The hardest thing for you to do from this point on in your life is to remain a humble servant. Because the Holy Spirit is in us to glorify who? Jesus. Jesus. That Jesus would be glorified. And I know I don't want to talk too much about that that movement back there, but what I love the most about every single video that I've seen so far, and last night I don't think I slept watching them, they were all just worship to Jesus. No, no, nothing against you, Tony, or our church, or anybody else's church, so I don't want anyone to do that, but no lights, no, no words, 
uh, no, no loud music, just people singing and glorifying God. People huddled in prayer, people, people coming up and confessing sin, and uh, little kids, uh, all races, and all, I mean, it's just all ages, and it's just a picture and a slice of, of possibly what heaven is like. I don't know, but they're just worshiping God over and over and over and over. You want to stay here after second service and worship? I'm sure that some people would just rather worship here than God knows what the halftime show is going to be. Do you think the world needs to be convinced that we need to be refreshed? I've never really preached about revival, but I'm experiencing what appears to be one right now. But just remember what it looks like. If your heart's going to be revived, then it's going to be filled with peace. Yes, it's going to have some joy. There's going to be some clap and a little bit of dancing. But at the end of the day, you walk straight. You turn from sin. Gossip. And useless, idle conversations. My little five-year-old grandson, he is trying to convince me, he's trying to convince his mom, he'll be here second year service, he'll probably be trying to convince Craig and Nancy to be baptized. You should hear him, five years old. I, mean, we're not, I, I haven't sat down and said, okay, son, th this is the gospel. Ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. A lot of it he gets from Superbook. If you got kids, get Superbook, it's amazing. But he says, Papa, I wanna be baptized. Why do you wanna be baptized? Because I need my sins forgiven. I need G I, I said, but, but baptism does it. He goes, I know baptism doesn't do that. But baptism tells everybody else that it is. Five years old. So, running out of time. I want to read another passage of scripture. And then we're going to do something very special. This is in Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, I'm just going to read this. I didn't give it to you, Steve. So there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God's a lot of ones here, and Father of all, who is over all and in all and through all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Look at the gifts. What does it mean, he said, that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? Question mark. Doesn't answer it. <laughs> He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill in all things. What is God doing? Why did he ascend? Why didn't he just change everything then? Because he's working on filling everything in. Who does he use? The church. And he gives you gifts to do it. And he says he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. So Though it, what a great place for a revival to break out than a place where they're training pastors and teachers and apostles and prophets. They're going to need them. The church needs them. And then he goes on and says, um, uh, why did he give them? Why did he give us apostles and prophets, evangelists, shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Why does he equip the saints for the work of the ministry? For the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ. For the building up of the body of Christ. And there's a lot more gifts than just those, uh, those positions, if you will. And Pastor Tony's gonna go through them. But, but what's the purpose of building up the body of Christ? So that we can attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Christ himself is what unifies the church. 
Christ unifies the church. As we submit to him and we submit to one another, we see unity, right? So that we can no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine because in these last days it says in Scripture that what we say is good, other people will call evil, and what we call evil, other people will say is good. And it's running rampant. And so how do we keep from being no longer children? By coming underneath, right? Coming underneath the Holy Spirit and the church and being built up by one another so that we can attain the unity and the knowledge of the Son to mature manhood so that we may no longer be children carried about by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ from whom the whole body is joined and held together by every joint with which is it equipped. When each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now listen, I, you know, I, I'm a man. I'm a human being with tendencies, right? It, with, with tendencies to take credit. I'm a human being with tendencies to wander away from being guided in truth. And so I, myself, sit in, a, in that room over there every two weeks with a group of men, a group of what the scripture calls elders. Elders are a gift from God. They're shepherds. They're overseers. They are a gift from God. And I get to sit underneath those gifts every two weeks in that room so that I don't wander, so that I don't take credit, so that I could be asked how my family's doing, how my wife and I are doing. I, I think, I, I am so grateful that God has given those kind of gifts to the church. I am one who has been blessed and encouraged by those gifts. Today, uh, we are going to instill an elder in front of all y'all on purpose because he, right, has been called to shepherd and to oversee and to administrate, huge gift of administration that goes on here at the church. And I'm going to ask if Brent and Sharon Thompson can come up here this morning. Come on up here. No, she was going to go sit down again. So this is Sharon Thompson and her husband, Brent Thompson. And uh, Brent has been functioning as an elder for a while. But we, are, we have uh, joyfully planned to... Um, to instill him this morning. So if the other elders would come up, and uh, Marty, and Tony, and Craig, Arnold. Uh, Marty's going to share a few minutes with uh, some scripture about uh, being an elder. And then Arnold is going to pray. We're going to anoint uh, you, uh, Brent. And I'm going to step out of the way here. Come on up here, Marty. So uh, it is with great delight that we gather today to appoint Brent Thompson, our brother in Christ, an elder in the Bride Church. And we can assure you, beloved, that, the, that uh, the Apostle Paul's charge of do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily has been well met concerning Brent's appointment. <laughs> <laughs> and as most of you in the congregation who have had time to get to know him personally, can also testify to. Amen? A cherished former pastor used to rightly say that you know an elder and a deacon in the church because elder's elder and deacon's deacon. This is certainly true with Brent, as many 
of you know by observing the fruit of his love and good works in addition to experiencing his good character, which has been above reproach in the church and also in his personal life. If you have not spent any time with Brent and Sharon, we recommend that you do, for your life will be greatly rewarded in the Lord. But of course, the scripture also instructs us to take additional step of appointing a prospective elder in the public, as Pastor Bob said. The apostles' intention for the growth and protection of the church was to appoint elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting and to commit them to the Lord. Paul charged the elders as shepherds of the flock to hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that you can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. So we know that the elders' main purpose then, don't we, is to proclaim the gospel and protect or warn the flock by guarding the word of truth. We have observed Brent mature greatly in this charge and are confident in his intention to uphold this admonition handed down from the apostles for your sake. We have witnessed that Brent indeed has become a protector of your souls as he has come to deeply know the scriptures that are useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness. Today, to say it as Peter lays it out for us, we have no fear that as a fellow elder, Brent will, Brent will shepherd the flock of God while exercising oversight and not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have him, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in his charge, but by being example to the flock as he has already displayed. We know that Brent feels the weight of an elder's responsibility as he knows from Scripture that he will, he will have to give an account to the Lord. And for all the church's part, our part, toward Brent as an elder, as an overseer, as a shepherd, Scripture says that we are to, what? Esteem him very highly in love because of his work, as he is an example to the flock, one that we should intimidate. The Apostle Paul told the elders at Ephesus, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his blood. So, given all this, beloved, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, and while following the pattern of the apostles' teaching, the elders are to gather around Brent, lay hands on him, and pray for him as we commit him to the Lord as an elder of the bride church. Amen? Amen. Arnold, come over here. Come over here, Arnold. Arnold is the elder among the elders. That's why I can't get up there. <laughs> No, you can come right there. He's going to anoint Brent, and uh, Arnold's going to pray over Brent. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Father, we're just so grateful to you, Father, that um, you count us among your own, and that you don't count our iniquities against us um, and father at this time we want to recognize all those things in Brent um, father that you have gifted him with um, as an elder in the bright church and father as an administrator that does so many things that uh, um, we don't know <laughs> the end of them um, but he's dedicated to you, to his wife, to his family, and to the, um, the uh, congregation here in the Bride Church. And Father, for that, we're forever grateful. And I just have to say that when I first met Brent, he was pretty intimidating. Man, this guy's smart. 
you know, and uh, I'll tell you, and he remembers, and um, just what a gift, and, and what a person to look to, to aspire to be like, as he loves the Lord and his family and the body here. So, uh, as uh, the scripture uh, tells us to do, uh, we're going to lay hands on Brent, recognizing the gifts in him. And, uh, Father, we pray that you would uh, continue to give Brent strength and uh, courage uh, in times of tough things. And, um, and Father, just the wisdom to um, know what to do and to how to step into his calling. And, Father, we've all here at our church been blessed by those very things. And we thank you that uh, Brent um, has chosen the bride to, uh, to uh, be a part of and to minister to all of us. And, uh, Father, we're just grateful for his love for you. And, Father, make us more like that. So, God, we just do this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Bless you, brother. We love you. So I'm going to be Bob here. Oh, I'm going to be Bob here, and maybe Brent would like to share a few things. Perfect. Yeah, you want to share anything? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't put you up to it. He did. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I'm going to be Pastor Bob for just a second, so that um, you know he likes to get people to kind of share their heart. So uh, anyhow, would you just say a few words? Bless us again, brother. Thanks, Arnold. Um, just what was on my heart this morning was um, my favorite scripture, and I'm not going to, I'm going to paraphrase in Hebrews 12 where it says, because we're surrounded by a huge cloud of witnesses, let us throw aside or cast off all the weight and the sin that hold us back and run the race with endurance that God set before us. And we do that by focusing on Jesus, who's the author and perfecter of our faith. And too often we lose focus. So this is what was on my heart this morning, if I can encourage you. Uh, sometimes we focus in the tough times, right? Because we need, we need help. So we call on Jesus. But when we get comfortable and things are going good, sometimes we forget to focus on him. And so if I can encourage you with anything, it's just to keep your focus on him all the time, every day. All right. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Brent. So we're going to close with uh, communion and uh, try not to disrupt the sacredness of the service, but we like to have fun as elders too. And so uh, I think it was Pastor Tony texted us, uh, we just had a board meeting Thursday, elder meeting Thursday, and he texted us about this revival back there, the possibility of it being a revival. And so um, one of the brothers, I can't remember who, told Marty, don't, don't cut your hair yet. <laughs> because he was one of those that got saved 50 years ago in that moment. So he's, trying to, he's trying to relive it, right? We've all... <laughs> we've all <laughs> <laughs> ah, uh, Jason, there's hope for you too, so you can grow yours out too. That's what Tony said. I don't know what I'm going to do, he says. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, anyway, you take your shoes off, right? Um, anyway, I'm excited. I hope you are. Uh, pray for Terry and I. We're going to be leaving Thursday to go to Arizona to do Hearts Being Healed and then do a, a funeral service for our really good friend, Craig Schertz, who he, he and his wife used to attend here. She used to lead the women's ministry. Craig used to play worship for us. And so uh, be praying for us, and uh, we'll be praying for you. And I hope when we get back, you guys will still be here today.
24 hours a day, seven days a week. No, I'm kidding. Anyway, so we'll, when communion comes around, uh, you know, I said in that video that, that baptism is a sacred act, and so is communion. Uh, we should not take lightly the opportunity that God would share his body and his blood with us, and that every time we do this, we do this in remembrance of him. We remember his perfect sacrifice. Remember his great love. Remember that he is the fullness, the visible proof of an invisible God, that the Father was in him and he was in the Father, and that those of us that by faith become in right standing with God through faith, we have access to this, his body and his blood, his blood to remit sin, his body for the healing, Faith in and of itself is a gift. It's a gift from the Holy Spirit that convinces us that we need to believe Him. We need to believe that He came and He fulfilled the law and that He healed the sick, opened the eyes of the blind, proclaimed the truth as a true prophet, revealed to us our need for Himself. gave the church this wonderful gift, this ordinance of breaking the bread and drinking the cup to remind us of the new covenant, to live inside that new covenant, that we would be taken away from the kingdom of darkness into this beautiful kingdom of light, that we truly would believe and be baptized and be filled with the Holy Spirit, that we would walk in a manner worthy of that calling. that we would remember this promise is not only for us and for our children, but for those that are far off and far away from him, this promise is for them too. And we pray, Lord God, you would continue to call us, that you would continue to fulfill your purposes and complete all in all, that you would equip the church for the work of the ministry, that you would edify, you would build up, that you would encourage the discouraged this morning, Lord. Let us eat and drink together.